It's a Friday evening. The rain's lashing down and I'm late. I only stopped the car at Sainsbury's to pick up a sandwich. <sighs> Shit. I'm going to be so late for the gig. Scott and the others are going to be livid. It's not like they can go on stage without the lead guitarist. So I'm cramming the sandwich in my mouth and I'm trying to reverse out of this spot. And suddenly there's this loud scraping sound. I've caught the car next to me. The woman's in the driver's seat, she looks livid. So I get out of the car and she does too, the rain's still lashing down, I'm getting soaked. I'm so sorry, I say. If you can just give me your name and details, I'm sure we can sort this out. I tell her I'm in a rush. She looks livid. Not happy at all, she's got a right face on her. Which is a shame because actually she's quite good looking. Late thirties maybe, long dark hair. Five minutes later, I'm driving off with a name and number on the back of my sandwich receipt. Jeanette Edwards. Two years later, and we're living together. <laughs> She's my, uh, what do you say, my partner. We're not married, uh, not exactly love's young dream. We've both been married before. I've got a large overdraft to show for it, and she's got two daughters. Katie and Hannah. Me and the girls get on all right, especially Katie, she's the younger. But Hannah, she's 12, a bit of a daddy's girl, so a bit more of a handful. And Jeanette, she's a good mum, works hard. She's a nursery nurse at the local primary school. She loves kids, wants another. I told her I'm not really that interested. But I want one with you, she says. If you really loved me, you'd give me what I wanted. I later found out she's not been on the pill. I haven't been taking it for months, apparently. You could have told me, I say. Why? So you can go run into your mummy and tell her what an evil little cow I am? Jeanette's got this thing about my parents. She thinks that they hate her. The thing is, they're, they're old-fashioned and stuck in the ways. My mum, in particular, was a bit shocked when she found out that Jeanette already had children. But Jeanette thinks that they look down on her. She even rang them up once to tell them so. Caused loads of problems between me and my parents. So I don't really see them that much now. I can't be doing with the hassle. Scott rings me up out of the blue. I haven't spoken to him since I quit the band over a year ago. Mike, he says, how have you been? Things haven't been the same without you. We've got five gigs lined up and we can't do them without you. I reluctantly agreed to meet him for a few drinks in town. I know what Jeanette's gonna say. She doesn't like me going out without her. Feels left out, I suppose. Me out enjoying myself, her stuck in with the girls. Plus she doesn't really like Scott. It's the band, I think. She doesn't get it. Staying out late. Playing to the audience, the attention. When we first started going out, she seemed quite taken with the fact that I was in a band. But then the questions started. Fairly innocent at first. Oh, did you get talking to anyone tonight? Or, I bet all the girls are throwing themselves at you. And then it gets more persistent. So by the time she's actually persuaded me to move in with her, the band has become a massive thing between us. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that I'm no longer living on my own in that damp-ridden bedsit in town. And Jeanette looks after me, that the house is immaculate. The thing is, she says, you've got responsibilities. It's not fair on the girls. You buggering off on an evening to play at being a rock star. I tell her that all I've ever really wanted to do is to perform, to, to play music. And yes, we only do it for a bit of extra money. We've, we've all got proper jobs. But we've got a big local following. It's fun. We get a buzz out of it. She tells me I need to grow up. I tell her I'm 38. She just glares at me. 
You're fooling yourself, she says. You're just not talented enough. And then one day I'm getting ready for work. The girls are at school and I can't find my suit jacket anywhere. I go downstairs and Jeanette says, who's Rachel? What? I'm confused. The bitch who's been texting you, she says. <laughs> Have you been looking through my phone, I say. Who is she, she repeats. And before I've had time to explain, she's off on one. Bitch, slag, prick tea, she's saying. The thing is, Rachel's a 62-year-old pub landlady. She came to see the band play the other week and she wants to book us for a fundraiser. Not that Jeanette's listening. She's off on one. Let's see what the bitch has to say, shall we? And she's threatening to ring her. And before I know it, the, the phone's out of my jacket pocket. She's pressed the call button. This Rachel picks up, I can hear her saying hello, hello. And Jeanette, she's screaming obscenities and I'm yelling at her for her to stop. And I mean, how embarrassing. I mean, thank God the girl's out there. So in the end, I decide to quit the band. It's just getting too much for Jeanette. I mean, I was having to miss gigs. Physically, she, she wouldn't let me leave the house sometimes. She, she, she'd be sitting in front of the front door. So I couldn't get out. Maybe she's right. Maybe I do need to grow up. Being a successful musician, it's, it's not for the likes of me, is it? No, I'll stick to my IT job. At least it pays well. So when Scott rings up a year later, I tell Jeanette that I'm going out with Paul, an old school friend. Or rather, I text her before she gets back from work. I mean, I know she's going to go ballistic. I'm going to pay for it when I get home, but... Well, sod it. I'm going. Look at me being all defiant. So we're going to town and it's, it's all cool with Scott. A few beers later, we're, we're talking out the band. Sister Morphine, we're both Stones fans. And then Scott says, So, are you up for returning to the band? I don't know, I say. I'll have to check to see what Jeanette thinks. Well, I know exactly what Jeanette will think, but I'm not telling Scott that. But he knows. I don't think he really likes Jeanette. He once said to me, jokingly, I think, you know, you could have Jeanette up for domestic abuse. <laughs> yeah, right. I think you'll find that happens to women, not men. I look at the clock. Shit. It's gone midnight. I get out my phone to ring a taxi. 84 missed calls, six voicemails, Jeanette. When I get back to Jeanette's, she's locked the front door. She's sat behind it and she's shouting, Michael, you bastard, you, you, you two-timing bastard. And I'm, and I'm saying, you know, what, what have I done wrong? I, I've just been out with my friend. The girls are up and out of bed and they're saying, Mom, Mom, are you okay? I'm just stood there on the doorstep. I see the light go on next door. And the nosy old cow, she comes to the bedroom window. <laughs> yeah, she'll love this. And then I look in the garden. And my clothes, they're strewn all over the front lawn. I can see my jacket is caught in all the rose bushes. The line is ripped by the thorns. Jeanette thinks I'm having an affair. Vicky at work. And in her head, that's where I was the other night, shagging Vicky. She's 
been on my laptop and she's looked at some old emails that I've sent, you know, to this Vicky, who happens to be my manager at work. I work in the IT department of the local police force. But Jeanette's got into her head now. I even said to Jeanette, oh, Vicky's been transferred to Chester and my new boss is a male. <laughs> you know, just try and put her mind at rest. But there's repercussions from the other night. Jeanette's got this list of demands. She wants to check my voicemails, phone calls, texts, emails. <laughs> like who contacts me these days? At the end of every evening, she wants the passcode to my phone. And she's going to check my mileage every day. She's worked out that a round trip to work is 38 miles. And, she says, I'm going to have your bank cards because she obviously can't be trusted with money. So every week she gives me enough money for petrol, to and from work, lunches, parking. Look, Jeanette's got a few trust issues. Uh, when she was younger, uh, her dad used to cheat on her mum and it's obviously affected Jeanette. And I'm a bit crap with money, so maybe I'll save a bit this way. Things are a bit better between me and Jeanette for the next few weeks. She seems happier and we spend some nice weekends with the girls. Scott's been ringing, he wants an answer about the band. So I text him to say that the answer's no. I don't want to risk upsetting Jeanette. But Scott won't take no for an answer. He just keeps ringing and leaving messages. So in the end, I block his number. I don't want Jeanette to suss what's been happening. And then one day I'm at work and Vicky says she needs me to go to a meeting tomorrow in Hull. You can take your own car, she says, and claim back the mileage at the end of the month. Well, it's a Monday, so the money that Jeanette's given me will cover the extra cost of the petrol, but then that's going to leave me short in the week. And how am I going to explain the extra 70 miles to Jeanette when she comes to check my mileage? I mean, she's not going to believe that it's to do with work. And because I can't claim the mileage back to the end of the month, I have nothing to back up my story. And I've just realised when I do eventually get the mileage claim for, it's going to be Vicky's signature on the bottom. Vicky, who Jeanette thinks has been transferred to Chester. It's going to be a repeat of the work's Christmas party. No partners allowed. I get a phone call at 9.30 from Hannah, Jeanette's oldest, saying, Mum's got these pills again. She's, she's taken some and, and she's saying she wants to die. So, I try to get out of going to the meeting. But Vicky's pretty dismissive. Michael, she says, it's an expectation of the job role. The next day, I ring in sick. And the day after. It's more plausible that way. I'm worried because it's not the first time recently I've had to do this. And my absence record's not going to look very good. And with everything that's been happening recently, I've been making stupid mistakes at work, you know, silly errors, but they've been picked up. On more than one occasion, the HR manager's asked me if, if I'm all right. On one occasion, he said, Mike, you look like shit. 
and I know Vicky's not happy. She doesn't believe a word. I'll be conducting your return to work interview, she says, when I get back to work on the Thursday. Great. I can just see Jeanette's face if I lose my job. 